Hey, listeners, Sam here. Before we start the show, an apology and a confession. So I forgot to check the levels on my recorder before recording the top of this episode, which means for about half the show, I'm going to sound a little weird, a little overmodulated, uh, but you can still hear me. I apologize for the weirdness this episode. I blame it all on vacation. All right. Thank you for listening. Here's the show. Hey, you are listening to Into It from Vulture and New York Magazine. And this is our very first episode of 2023. Happy freaking New Year. We have a really good episode for y'all to start this year off right. A little bit later, we're going to talk about how 2023 might kind of perhaps be bad for Hollywood. In fact, our guest in this show says that 2023 could be the year of Hollywood recession. But we'll tell you why that maybe could make some TV and movie viewers kind of happy. We'll explain all that a bit later. But first, a game. Our very first game of this new year. Going to play Into It, Not Into It with friend of the show, Alex Abad Santos. Hello. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Happy New Year. Happy, happy, happy New Year. Um, Thank you for coming back on the show. You brought a friend with you this time, right? I did. I brought my friend Sam. Sam loves women's tennis with me, and we text about women's tennis all the time. And I was just like, who better to talk about pop culture with than my friend Sam? I love her. Sam, Sam. tell folks who you are. (laughs) Hi, I'm Sam Greisman. Um, I'm a friend of Alex's. I'm a screenwriter. I live in New York. Um, And I do love women's tennis (laughs) very much. Alex and I share the same childhood obsession with uh, women's tennis that was very much a coded... Uh, thing about our sexuality but <laughs> well we we very much we would like when i knew i knew sam was good people when he was just like i would die for serena williams i'm like i would too i would like if she yeah. needs a kidney oh, yeah. if she needs a new knee she can take mine yeah i have never felt so so much anger towards a stranger <laughs> as i felt towards the doctors and nurses who were like mean to serena when she was in labor yeah, like oh her whole God. thing was like she was having a seriously hard pregnancy, and the doctors wouldn't take her seriously. And I'm just like, if I ever see that person, it's on site. Like it's uh, we're fighting. Uh, yeah, for me, it's like <laughs> anyone who's ever beaten Serena. I was, I was like, you're on a list. <laughs> so you want to fight Venus? Yeah, Angela Kerber is on is on a list. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> So when you two aren't talking about women's tennis, uh, Sam, you're a screenwriter. Alex, you actually work for our my parent company. What do you do? I'm a culture correspondent for Vox.com. I mean, we were on earlier, I think maybe like a month ago, talking about Marvel and talking about all that stuff. And so we talked about Marvel in advance of the new Black Panther movie. Then I watched the new Black Panther movie and didn't love it. Oh, I'm sorry. But like, so am I. The Talokans are kind of fierce, though. Uh, yeah. When they start yeah. singing and everyone starts jumping, like who, like they start <laughs> singing that banger, and you're just like, yes, absolutely, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sam, Alex, I'll explain the game to both of you, and then we'll play it. It's really easy and it's low stakes because there's no prize or anything. Basically, I share three stories from the zeitgeist, from pop culture, and you just tell me if you're into this thing or not into this thing. And at the end, I will pick a winner based on how much I like your opinions. Okay? Perfect. I I hope Sam wins. Sam is always right. Wait. Y'all are too nice. (laughs) Knives out, claws out. I I hope I win. I don't want Alex to win. I need these knives out and these gems uncut. Let's fight. Okay? Okay. 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 All right. First, are you into or not into the very fancy gym chain Equinox (laughs) pranking new members on New Year's Day? Did you hear about this? I heard about it. And honestly, I'm into it. Okay. Tell folks what happened since you heard about it. Well, I guess they said or they like put up an announcement that they were not into the you know, new year, new me vibe. And so they weren't letting you join the gym, join Equinox just like January 1st. And you know what? I'm just kind of into it. Like, really? Okay. Okay. It's crazy and ridiculous and awful, but you know what? Fine. And also Equinox is terrible and everyone there is terrible. So they might as well just lean into it. (laughs) Okay. We know where you stand. Alex, are you into it or not into it? 
I am into it, but because, like, they kind of set themselves on fire. <laughs> like, the way the internet works is that you need, like, a main character every day, right? Like, it makes the internet more fun. And when I mean the internet, I mean, like, Twitter, social media. And it's just like, well, they kind of set themselves up. And it's just like you had people on the internet being like, well, like, let's be real. What goes on at Equinox isn't just exercise. Like, <laughs> very... <laughs> flagrantly homosexual men love to go to Equinox not just to exercise, right? And so it's... <laughs> so I'm kind of into anyone, any self-immolation, like any brand that wants to really go there and do that because like people will... Dra- they will drag you up no, and down. I want to read the message to y'all. Yeah, it's so wild. So here is the message. Janae, can you add the scoring right now? Here we go. <laughs> This is a dramatic reading of Equinox's We Don't Speak January campaign. Here goes. It begins, We Don't Speak January. We're not accepting new memberships today. It's not you. It's January. January is a fantasy delivered to your door in a pastel-colored box. It talks about change. It needs a new outfit before it can begin. Shortcutting, giving up just a few weeks later. You are not a New Year's resolution. Your life doesn't start at the beginning of the year, and that's not what being part of Equinox is about. We go beyond what's possible. We defy expectations. We are not moderation. We want it all every day, and you deserve it all. At Equinox, we don't speak January, and neither do you. We look forward to welcoming you to our Equinox community tomorrow. (laughs) Wow. I got to go have a cigarette. My God. I'm sorry. Poet just like, Laurea is shaking listen. right now. <laughs> you know what? I hate it. I hate it. This is like th- this is the energy of the rich hot girl at your high school who wouldn't let you sit at her freaking table at the cafeteria. Like. It's that energy. It's so mean girl. It's so mean girl. But you, everyone hates the mean girl. Like, w- And there's like kind of community but wants in hating to be the, the mean, mean girl. girl. But they also want to be the but mean girl. But it's also not even like hot mean girl. It's like mean girl like <laughs> who's friends with all the hot girls that is, is mean because of that. Yeah, like, it's okay. the mean girl with the hot, with the cool house that everyone parties yeah, at. Yeah, like a cool house. I'm like, yeah, well, I know we don't like Ashley, but like her house, <laughs> have you seen her house? <laughs> Ashley oh, lives in West that. Hollywood. You seen yeah, her Ashley house. definitely lives in West Hollywood <laughs> on one of those side streets. We are all not into it. Let's move on uh, to another heavy hitter. Are you into? <laughs> this one is funny. I'm sorry. I'm so nervous. Are you into? <laughs> are you into or not into reparations, specifically from the family of Benedict Cumberbatch? Oh my god! <laughs> Did y'all see this? Yes. Did y'all see this? Yes. So like he, very he, like, he but... like his family owned a plantation, right? And then yes. closed it, were paid out, but then he has to pay the money back, maybe? Perhaps? Maybe. So the whole thing is just ridiculous, and it all stems from the general audacity of Barbados, which I commend. So Barbados, uh, mm-hmm. former member of the Commonwealth, they have been out here saying, screw the monarchy, screw imperialism for a while. A few years ago, they officially left the Commonwealth. They left the whole UK. And right. on the day that they did it, they also declared Rihanna like their national hero. They kind of made her their new queen, which yeah. I love. <laughs> <laughs> and to continue in that spirit, they have recently made a national task force on reparations. And they're basically going back through the files to see who in Barbadian history had slaves and should pay some money for how they profited from slavery. And the thing about slavery in the Commonwealth is that slave owners didn't just profit from the slaves when they had the slaves. Once the UK ended slavery across the monarchy, they also gave reparations to the former slave owners. They paid out the slave owners. So now in Barbados, there's a task force on all of this, and it's looking to see who should pay money back 
to Barbados now for what they got back then. And at some point, Benedict Cumberbatch and his family get involved in this conversation. Apparently, one of his ancestors, Abraham Cumberbatch, uh, had a plantation that they bought in the 18th century, and they had about 250 slaves until it was abolished in the monarchy in 1834. Uh, So they made a a fortune— during slavery on that plantation. But then when slavery was abolished, the Cumberbatch family got a payout of 6,000 pounds from the British government, which would be worth about a million dollars in today's money. That's wild. I mean, can I say that I'm very into it? I'm so into it. I am so deeply into it. I'm also into it, so you can... (laughs) Yes, take take Benedict Cumberbatch, get some of that Marvel money, give it, to, like, you know what, whatever Rihanna wants to do, I want Rihanna to ask for the money. I'm very into it because I, I mean, for reparations, and also because I think we've, like, Benedict Cumberbatch has been kind of forced down our throat, like, yeah. as if he's, like, attractive and interesting, and I, you know what, yeah, let's take some money from him, I don't want any more, like, also, we, we've been through enough. Benedict Cumberbatch was in 12 Years a Slave, right? And he played a slave owner! <laughs> the name Abraham Cumberbatch. If you're named that, you're a slave owner. There's just no way. Like, how can you go on and not be a slave owner named Abraham Cumberbatch? Yeah. Yes. Anywho, so here's where the story gets choices. Choices. Yes. Choices. Here's where it gets complicated. So there was some confusion about all of this because in this initial Telegraph article that quoted a rep from this task force on reparations, and they mentioned the Cumberbatch family which led to even more speculation that they'd be forced to pay out. But then later, that same commission said, y'all misread the quote. We're really going to go after, like, governments and corporations, not maybe families. So who knows now if Benedict will be forced to pay anything? I feel like he has to pay now because the PR of it, like, he's just going to have to be like, I know, but anyway, here's some money. (laughs) Because I feel bad. We know he has Marvel money. He's oh, just going to have to. I need, like, the Cumberbatch family memorial scholarship at, like, Howard University. Like, I want it to be. <laughs> I want it to be big. <laughs> no, I, but you know what I also want to know? I'm kind of nosy. I want to see what else, like, what other big wig families are in are on that list. Like, I want well, to. Uh, baby, like, that's more interesting to me than the what? This is a can of Pringles. Once you pop, you can't stop. <laughs> if you start with this, you're gonna realize all the fancy I'm, whites. All yeah, the fancy well, whites. Well, yeah, there was the ben, there was like the Ben Affleck thing where he was on that Find Your Root show and found out that his family was slave slave owners. So that they're all out there. I'm somewhere. very. Yeah, no, I want to see. I think they should just. You know what? This is more. Sorry to politics reporters, but like, <laughs> I know the January six files are really important, but. I feel like the Barbados <laughs> reparation files. Please commi- come on, like, decommission that. them. Let's see. Let's Listen, let's see those yes. papers. Also, if you are an A-list white in Hollywood, do not say yes to DNA testing. Don't go down that road. <laughs> you don't want to know. You really don't. <laughs> <laughs> Last question for this game: Are you into or not into? Angela Bassett's son doing the fake celebrity death challenge. Not not into. Same. I mean, he's 16, so, like, we all make... But, like, it, that was just, like, a friend... That's basically just telling your mom that a friend of hers died. Like, that. There's it, that's not the celebrity death challenge. Yeah, it was just, like, weird. Tell folks what happened, Sam. So he did the, like, TikTok celebrity death challenge thing, that the one that's going around where you tell your parents, like, Andy Cohen, dead at whatever age, and they freak out, and then you say, no, sorry. (gasps) Eminem died at 50. Fuck you! Dad, Dad, Bon Jovi dead at 60. (gasps) Shut your mouth. You're lying. (gasps) Mom, Celine Dion dead in plane crash. Shit! No! Dead at 54. She's 58. No, also, to start, that's freaking weird. The internet is so crazy and sad. Why it's is this so a thing weird. anyway? I don't know. It's so strange. But then she did it to her. He did it to her. His mom, who who with Michael B. Jordan, who she's been in movies with and is a friend with, too, and was just like Michael B. Jordan dead at thirty eight or whatever, and and like th- that was just telling your mom that her friend died. <laughs> it's not the it's same. So weird. Well, it's like Alex. What about you? Well. 
absolutely not into it, but also because of like, one, it's Angel Bassett. Like that would strike fear in me. But yes. two, it's like uh, Angel Bassett and the entire cast and crew. I'm not sure, like I'm not privy to like what, what happened with Chadwick Boseman, right? But like, I think a lot of that was a surprise to many people and he kept it very close to his chest. And it was just like, well, this is a woman that's experienced loss with one of her coworkers and best friends. And you're going to do that again? That's not a funny joke. It's very weird. It's Mm -hmm. such a weird trend. And I'm also just like, I don't want, I wouldn't want to know what people's reaction to me dying was. Cause I would just assume they would be like, oh, oh well, anyway, (laughs) like I wouldn't want to find that out. Um, his mother got him together really quick. His apology, uh, he said in it, taking part in a trend like this is completely disrespectful. I don't wish any bad ramifications upon his family nor my parents as they deserve none of the backlash. Imagine being Angela Bassett's <laughs> PR team having to deal with this one. Because, like, there's what Angela wants to do and what the PR right. team wants to do. And I guarantee you Angela wanted to spank his behind all across Los Angeles. I guarantee yeah. you that. She went mom on him. Like She, she went Wakanda. Went- she gonna go Wakanda <laughs> <Yeah>. on him. <laughs> On that note, we have concluded the game. Uh, I think we all agreed on everything. So to choose the winner, I'm going to just say, Alex, you won because you were the most stressed about this game. And that was kind of cute. <laughs> it was, That's fair. I was tell- I've been telling everyone I'm just nervous of what he's going to ask me because I like my sometimes I feel like pop culture is such a big topic. But you do literally cover pop culture yeah, for it, a living. It's the stress. The stress is part, <laughs> is part of the process. <laughs> the stress. The stress. It is now 2023. Happy New Year. You know, it's hard to predict just how this year will turn out, seeing as it's just begun. But there's a good chance this year you will hear one word a lot. Recession. It seems we are due for one. Corporations are getting ready for it. Prognosticators are talking about it. And over here at Vulture, we are wondering what a recession might look like for the entertainment industry. So to kick off this year, I spoke with someone who knows the industry quite well, Matt Bellany. Matt used to run The Hollywood Reporter, and now we host a podcast all about the industry. It's called The Town. I asked Matt what a Hollywood recession might look like, both for the biz itself and also for all the viewers like you and me. So the premise of this chat is kind of me asking the big question, is Hollywood in a recession or not? But I feel like we can't ask that question without first defining Hollywood. (laughs) I assume it includes all streaming. I assume it includes movies and movie theaters. But, like, I don't think we're going to include the music industry for this or tech and media. Or are we? How do you define it for this kind of I wouldn't include music, but I would include aspects of tech and media because the frank reality is is that Hollywood is a tech-controlled business these days. Um, It's not all the tech companies do. And I think it's a a tiny portion if you look at their overall market caps and what they gives them an actual value. But most of these companies are either controlled by tech companies or they are trying to become tech companies. So that's, we got to have that out of the way first. Um, I define Hollywood as professionally produced video content that is made and distributed. So that can be everything from your favorite television show to watching Monday Night Football on ESPN, to things that you find on YouTube. Okay. So with that working definition, here's the big question. Is Hollywood in a recession right now? And how do you know the answer to that question? I think the answer to that question is yes. There is a content okay. recession going on right now. Okay. And the way I would define that is simply looking at the numbers. All of these companies that make professionally produced films and television shows are looking to pull back. They want to make less of it. Huh. Name the companies. I mean, everything from Warner Brothers Discovery to NBC Universal to Paramount Global to the Walt Disney Company to Sony Pictures. All of these companies have either announced layoffs or have said that they are planning hiring freezes or cost cutting in the new year. 
And that's a recession in my mind. Now, okay. it comes amid a decade-long run-up in the amount of content that is out there. And the streaming services have all poured money into this content run-up in order to grab scale. They all operated from the belief that if you got to three, four, 500 million customers worldwide, you would win. You would be one of the three or four companies that is going to emerge from this war as the dominant players in entertainment for the next 20 years. That rationale has been questioned over the past eight yeah. to 10 months. These companies yeah. now are looking at their profitability. They're looking at their balance sheets. The CEO of the Walt Disney Company got fired about a month ago because people looked at the cost of competing in the streaming wars and he lost $1.5 billion in a quarter. And they're saying, wow. wait a second, we want to have a great streaming service, but we also got to have a business here. So we want this to be a more cost justified business. And that necessarily means less content. Besides less content, which I, for one, welcome, what else does a Hollywood recession look like? How big and bad are layoffs? Are there other things that will just make the entertainment world feel differently in the midst of Hollywood recession? The layoffs are a real thing. And I talk to people all over town who are terrified. It's anxiety inducing knowing that these companies are going through contractions because in the streaming age, which I think began about 2010, 2011, with the emergence of Netflix as a streaming power, really began in 2013 when Netflix started making originals with House of Cards and some of the others. Hollywood has never really seen a real recession. Um, you could say that for the larger economy as well since 2008, but there has been such an unprecedented run-up in the amount of content that there are people in the business who have never experienced this kind of pullback. So it's shocking for a lot of people to see layoffs and to see these companies. I mean, we're, this happened at HBO Max. They just unrenewed a show called Minx, which was renewed for a second season. The Batgirl movie wow. was another famous one where yeah. that was almost done. And they said, you know, we'd rather have a $90 million tax write-off than release this movie, which we believe is bad. And that's something that was pretty unprecedented in the entertainment industry. The creative people are like, what? I put my heart and yeah. soul into this movie and you're telling me you'd rather have a tax write-off? That was very controversial. But this situation with Minx was, I believe they said they were going to renew it a few months ago. And then now they have reconsidered that and have essentially said, huh. yeah, you know, we're not going to do that. And that's all about cost cutting. In terms of the layoffs, you know, Netflix has laid off folks. A lot of other media companies have laid off and are consolidating and merging. Are the layoffs just about done or are there more coming? Oh, I think there are more coming. I mean, no, I don't know about Netflix. They they started sort of started they kicked off this trend earlier this year where they had a really bad earnings call where they revealed that they actually lost subscribers in the US for the first time in like a long, long time. And they laid off people and there was a retrenchment there. I don't know about Netflix in the new year, but NBC Universal has said that layoffs are coming in the new year. And I think Disney has said a uh, hiring freeze and some other cost cutting measures. But if the economy trajectory continues as it is, they're going to have no choice but to lay people off. Help me out with this feeling I have about the Hollywood recession, Matt. In the larger macro economy, when it comes time for a recession, I'm like, oh, that sucks. Sorry about that. Not going to be nice. But something about this Hollywood recession, I can't help but have this gnawing feeling where I just in the back of my head keep saying, well, psh, of course, y'all had that coming. Like, I know it sounds mean, but it feels like so much of Hollywood's logic the last decade plus was flawed. And this recession is somewhat their own fault. Like, did Hollywood have this coming? The strategy of pumping billions into streaming with not a bunch of ad revenue to be had in streaming while also putting fewer movies in theaters and also keeping them there for shorter time frames and also having no real strategy to keep people from cord cutting. Hollywood's math hasn't been mathing for years, and I just can't help but feel like they brought this on themselves to a certain extent. Am I wrong to feel that way? Well, I don't know if I would say they brought this on themselves because all of this has been fueled by the tech companies. I mean, Netflix changed the model of all of these traditional studios by delivering content over the internet. And these traditional studios needed to figure out their internet strategy 
It's just that, that we're finding that delivering content over the internet is not as lucrative as delivering it through linear television. And yeah. that's having repercussions across the entire ecosystem. And it's a kind of reality of internet and streaming that other industries have had to face earlier. The news media had to face the rise of the internet and how do you monetize journalism online. Music had to deal with people no longer buying CDs, but buying MP3s and then streaming. Like it, It's like it's almost kind of in some ways just Hollywood's turn. I will say what I've been really interested by is how candid industry executives have been about all of this. David Zaslav, who is the chief executive of Discovery, he said, quote, to the LA Times, let's face it, the strategy to collapse all windows, starve linear and theatrical, and spend money with abandon while making a fraction in return, all in the service of growing sub numbers, has ultimately proven, in our view, to be deeply flawed. The executive chairman of AMC Networks, James Dolan, he said, quote, or wrote, quote, we are primarily a content company, and the mechanisms for the monetization of content are in disarray. How unusual is it for executives to be so candid about how screwy their business model is right now? Feels weird. It does a little bit, but what choice do they have? I mean, they are faced with these daunting numbers, and Wall Street knows what's going on. I mean, these companies have operated under the single premise that building subscribers was the way to get a high stock price and ultimately survive the streaming wars. That is the number one mantra of the entertainment business for the past five to seven years. And we found this year that that's no longer going to cut it. So what do you do? You have to admit, and obviously what David Zasloff is doing there is he is blaming the previous regime. He took over the Warner Brothers assets this past April, and he's now the CEO of Warner Brothers Discovery. And the previous CEO's strategy was to do exactly that, take the entire 2021 slate of Warner Brothers movies and put them on the streaming service, HBO. Max the same day they were in theaters, which very effectively helped build subscribers to HBO Max, but it also really hurt the studio and it collapsed all these other home video windows that were revenue drivers. It, he also took all the content throughout the company and hoarded it on HBO Max, not allowing them to exploit it in other venues, which took money away from the company, but created a higher value proposition for HBO Max. Now, if you talk to Jason Kylar, who's the former CEO, he would say that doing that really put HBO Max in the position to be one of those dominant streamers that survives this period of growth. Whereas if we look at something like Peacock or Paramount Plus, who which are considered second tier services, there's a real question as to whether they can survive long term or whether they will have to merge or simply fold. Yeah. We mentioned earlier that other fields have experienced the same kind of challenge, the disruption brought by new technology. What can the way that other industries and how they've grappled with just the change that the internet has wrought, what lessons can they teach Hollywood, if any? You know, it's funny. I, I think that the lessons of those companies were out there. I mean, it's kind of amazing that Hollywood sat and looked what happened with the music industry, with Napster, and essentially turning their business over to Apple and allowing Steve Jobs to decide that 99 cents was going to be the cost of a song, and then turning their business over to Spotify and Apple Music, which decided what the cost of the streaming music bundle was going to be. They looked at this happening and the dip that the music industry suffered before now coming back and really asserting itself, and they didn't seem to learn many lessons. They, they let Netflix come into their own backyard, and they gave them content for years they, trying to make their bottom lines. to Netflix. I still exactly. can't believe that. The they hell? gave friends to Netflix. They gave, I mean, all of these companies. It wasn't even that long ago. It was like five years ago where you wanted to watch a Disney movie on home video. You went to Netflix to watch a Marvel movie on home video. They had the first window because they paid Disney a bunch of money yep. to license yep. those Marvel movies. Yep. And 
I, Bob Iger has said this, the new old CEO of Disney. He has said that they essentially funded their enemy for years and years and years by giving them this content. And it was all because it's like the innovative's dilemma. They were trying to pad their quarterly earnings to make their bonuses and to keep their investors happy because they saw this as a way to make money when the DVD market was going south. So they just sold off the content until they finally realized Netflix is going to eat our lunch. Netflix is now what? At the time they had 150, 170 million subscribers. And Disney was like, you know what? We need our own service. We're Disney for God's sakes. We have to have our own streaming service. And they hoarded all the content. They took it mm -hmm. away from Netflix. And now Disney, if you combine Disney plus Hulu and ESPN plus, there's more subscribers than Netflix worldwide. Now they double up in a certain in certain places, so it's not totally apples to apples. But Disney has made big strides in a very small amount of time, and Netflix always knew this was going to happen. Ted Sarandos has said this. He said he knew that they were going to come around and realize that they shouldn't be giving us all their content, and it took mm. them a few years longer to realize it than even Ted Sarandos thought. <laughs> so then will they come out of all of this smarter or still be just as dumb? I mean, that's a tough question to answer because <laughs> nobody knows what the right strategy is right now. I mean, the, the what do you think the right strategy is? I think the right strategy is something down the middle. It's pretty clear that you do not need to hoard all of your content on your streaming service to have a growth trajectory in streaming. Most of the content that is consumed by people is the new stuff. Yeah, it's nice to have a library on there, but... It's about producing new and alluring content for customers to be excited about and that they keep subscribed to your service. On the overall profits versus streaming question, I think these companies got to think about the bottom line more. You know, they, they should be putting these movies in theaters because they can make money in theaters if they do yeah. it right. They should make Glass the kind of onion, movies. Glass Onion, anybody? Glass yeah, Onion, I mean, Netflix, I'm you know, still mad about that. Netflix is not mad. They did a stunt to appease the filmmaker, Ryan Johnson. I happen to think they would have gotten a bigger marketing bump out of putting Netflix, uh, putting Glass Onion in more theaters and being the number one movie that weekend because that would have been a big marketing flex for them. They would have been able oh, to yeah, count totally. that. And it would have ultimately led to more viewers for the movie when it debuts on streaming at the end of this month. But that's not what Netflix wants. They're like, if we're going to spend all this money, we want to grow subscribers. That's our business. So, you know, we're talking about all of this doom and gloom in Hollywood right now. Bottom lines not being met, people being laid off. I feel bad about that. I don't want anyone to lose their job. But I got to look at some of this selfishly as a viewer, as someone who is overwhelmed and tired by all the TV and movies there are to watch right now. And so my question to you is like, yes, this is a Hollywood recession. Companies are going to be making fewer shows and movies. There may actually be fewer companies making this content with all the mergers and acquisitions happening. Will that, though, for viewers like me, actually be a good thing? Fewer things to watch on fewer platforms? That sounds like a relief, Matt. Maybe. I mean, you feel overwhelmed, but what happens when they come for your favorite show? Are you a D Dangerous Liaisons fan on Stars? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, because they, they just they just unrenewed it. Stars just unrenewed Dangerous Liaisons for a second season. Who and is in Dangerous Liaisons on Stars? I, I don't know, but it was a Dangerous Liaisons <laughs> okay. TV show on Stars. So my point okay. is like it's easy to say that we're all overwhelmed, but there are shows out there that I have found that I love that would not exist if it weren't for this content bubble that we've been in. You know, I love a show on HBO Max called uh, The Other Two, which is a comedy. It's sort of a family comedy with a oh, yeah. Yeah, about a, 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 the, the other siblings of a, a family where the one kid is a pop star. That it's is really an HBO, hilarious. Yeah, that is an HBO Max comedy. They picked it up from Comedy Central when Comedy Central didn't want to make any more of it. That is an exact kind of show that was allowed to go on and find an audience because of this peak TV situation. In the before times, 
Comedy Central would have canceled it and it would have gone away. So you can think of lots of shows like that. You know, reality shows on HBO are going away. Like, did you, were you a fan of F Boy Island? I, I, I was not, but. <laughs> Do I live and breathe? Do I live and breathe, Matt? If you were a fan of that, <laughs> that is going away, as are a lot of the reality shows that HBO made. So there are genres that are going to just go away and shows that are not going to be made and shows that may have had a third, fourth, fifth season that are going to end after two seasons. For the consumer, that is going to be a bummer. But like you said, there's still a lot of choice out there, and it's not like these companies are abandoning content. They're still making a buttload of shows and movies. So I'm not worried about there being interesting stuff to watch. Okay. Will there be fewer platforms or more consolidation? Because I also think that might help my experience. Now I'm just like... Which app do I have to have this week to watch my show? Will this Hollywood recession in any way solve that problem? I think it will. And ultimately, the the former CEO of Warner Media wrote an op-ed for the journal in which he said that ultimately there will be three global streaming services, plus Apple and Amazon that are just doing this for fun, essentially. But Who were the three? uh, He did not say which ones there will be. I assume Netflix and Disney will be two of them, and then there will be a third. It doesn't mean there won't be smaller services that crop up and are more niche plays, but in terms of all audience streaming services, I think we're going to settle into a three to five service around the world. These are the big players list, Um, and those will also probably have sports as well. Okay, so what I hear you saying is things might be simpler after all of this, to which I say thank you. It doesn't necessarily mean that you won't pay a bunch more money for them because ultimately when they settle in, they're going to probably charge more. Or Uh this may all end up in a bundle. We may be headed to a cable style bundle where you pay a (laughs) hundred bucks a month and you get all the services and then they divvy up the money based on how much you're watching of each one. So that could end up in, in, and ultimately for the business, that might be better because the goal here is to get people to pay for things they don't watch. (laughs) That's sad. Cable is dead. Long live cable. Matt Bellany, thank you so much. (laughs) No problem. Thanks again to Matt Bellany. You can read his work over at the journalism startup Puck. Also, check out his podcast. It's called The Town. Culture Geist. Culture Geist. You're listening to Culture Geist. Culture Geist. I don't know, y'all. And now for a segment we're calling Culture Geist. About all the things we can't stop thinking about. The culture that's haunting you, haunting me, haunting all of us, for better or worse. Hi, Sam. You're my favorite. Here's my culture, guys. Uh, Moulin Rouge, uh, when it came out, I was um, real impressionable. I was fresh into college. Um, So I remember I went out and I bought the uh, bonus features DVD and I don't know, maybe two versions of the soundtrack because there was like an extended version. I don't know, whatever. I listened to the hell out of the thing. I uh, memorized all the songs. It, It made a impact on my life, I guess. And um, I still, to this day, anytime my cat is um, complaining, you know, in that cat way, you know, like, oh, you never let me out or, oh, you, you don't feed me ever. Come and get me, boys. What I'll do um, to, I guess, relieve my feelings about that is, um, is I'll say, talk to me, Harry Ziegler. Tell me all about it. In my head, you know, the big brass band is swelling and I'm on a trapeze and I don't know, whatever. Um, It fills me with joy. And that's my story. Hello, this is Melanie, originally from North Carolina, calling from Berlin. Um, And the culture guys that has been haunting me for years now um, is related to the classic New York Times podcast, The Daily. From The New York Times, I'm Michael Barbaro. This is The Daily. For anyone who listens to know, you know the Michael Barbaro, the host, has a very distinct kind of cadence and voice. Today. And at the end of each episode, he just says, 
Uh, I'm Michael Barbaro. See you tomorrow. That's it for The Daily. I'm Michael Barbaro. See you tomorrow. And then one listener commented on how he, for some reason, started every day when he listened to the podcast, switch it around to be, I am Michael tomorrow. See you, Babaro. Um, I love this. I don't know why. It just brought me so much joy. And now every single day I will listen to this podcast and I will just think, you know, it's Michael tomorrow and he will see me, Babaro. Hi, this is Tessa calling from Washington, D.C. I've been wavering for months on whether or not this is a culture guys, but I mean, it is 1.03 in the morning and I am awake and thinking about it. So you could definitely say that it is haunting me. It's this commercial that used to be on Hulu frequently, but I haven't seen it very recently um, for Pampers New Leaf Pull Up. I'm a big kid now. In this commercial, there's a girl and a bear walking through a jungle. Um, animated, of course. The girl does a cartwheel because her pull-ups are so comfortable. And the bear lets out this Tom Hanks-style chuckle. I can do anything like this. Did you see it? Yeah. It sounds like this, like, huh <laughs> It doesn't sound like that. It sounds like Tom Hanks making that sound. Yeah. I just want to know if that's what the director was going for. But they don't do director's commentaries on commercials. And also everyone that I've shown this to has told me that it doesn't sound like Tom Hanks. <laughs> is it me? <laughs> is it me? <laughs> I desperately want to go to sleep, so wish me luck. Good night. <laughs> Thanks again to Tessa, Melanie, and Megan. Listeners, do you have a culture geist? A thing in the culture that's been haunting you for days or weeks or even years? Share it with us. The more specific you are, the better. Send us a short voice memo at intuit at vulture.com. Intuit at vulture.com. Also, if you like this show and want to support it, we could use your help. Subscribe to Intuit on your favorite podcast app. Leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And most importantly, share with your friends. Tell your friends that you like this show and ask them to listen to it as well. Every little bit helps. All right, Intuit is hosted by me, Sam Sanders. The show is produced by Janae West, Travis Larchuk, Gabby Grossman, and Jelani Carter. Our fearless editor is Jordana Hochman. Our engineer is Daniel Turek. Our music is composed by Breakmaster Cylinder. And Hannah Rosen is the editorial director of audio at New York Magazine. All right, listeners, we are back next Thursday with a new episode. Till then, happy new year. Talk soon. <laughs>